All right. So we are right at six o'clock and we are going to go ahead and we will get started. I want to be respectful of everybody's time um, and get you out of here as close to seven um, as possible. Um, and I just want to introduce myself. My name is Tara Du Bois. I'm the communications coordinator for the Cape Perpetual Collaborative. Um, and the Cape Perpetual Collaborative's vision is to foster conservation and collaboration within local communities for scientific exchange management, awareness, and stewardship from the land and sea in and around the Cape Perpetual Marine Reserve. Um, we have several founding partners. You can see their logos here, um, including federal, uh, state, uh, nonprofits, and a tribe. Um, and our three guiding principles are community engagement, leveraging resources, and engaging in partnerships. Um, and as I had mentioned uh, real briefly that our uh, collaborative, we focus uh, our, our work around the or, uh, Cape Perpetual Marine Reserve. It's Oregon's biggest of five marine reserves. Um, you can see here there, uh, we have a marine reserve in red and we have marine protected areas in blue to the north and the south. Uh, the difference between a marine reserve and a protected area is in the marine reserve, there is no take of any wildlife or ocean development um, at all within the marine reserve. And in the marine protected areas to the north and the south, um, there's still no ocean development, uh, but some take is allowed, and that is dependent upon which marine protected area that um, you're talking about. And every marine reserve has a, an adjacent marine protected area to it. Uh, this area stretches between Yahats, uh, just, just north of Smelt Sands, all the way down to almost Florence. Um, and the Cape Perpetual Collaborative uh, hosts a variety of community science projects, as you can see here, um, between seabird monitoring, sea star surveys, uh, beach cleanups. Um, we also host a winter speaker series and uh, the Land Sea Symposium, as well as other variety of opportunities. And you can find out more information on our website at capeperpetualcollaborative.org um, or visit us on our Marine Reserve, uh, Cape Perpetual Marine Reserve Facebook page. And we've also just started a YouTube channel um, under the Cape Perpetual Collaborative. Um, and that is also where, where we will be uh, storing and housing our recordings of these uh, webinars that we are going to be doing as well. Um, so you can watch a replay if you'd like. Um, and with that, um, Given that our focus is the Marine Reserve and all up and down uh, the central coast here between Florence and, and Yahats, you see many different rocky areas. Um, and with those rocky areas, it wouldn't be possible without volcanic action. Um, and so with that, I want to introduce Dave M Muter. Um, he grew up in San Diego near the beach and has never lived more than 50 miles away from salt water. Um, he had a curiosity about the ocean of rocks that led him to get his BS in geology from Oregon State University, and he got his PhD in geological oceano oceanography from University of Rhode Island. Um, during his studies, he sailed on many oceanographic cruises to collect deep sea sediments. He served in the Peace Corps in Malaysia, where he was a high school physics teacher and a geologist for the Geological Survey of Malaysia. And then he finally settled into a career as a geophysicist specializing in how sound moves through rocks. And he taught classes in this specialty around the world. Uh, since retiring, he enjoys volunteering at the Seattle Aquarium and also at the Cape Perpetual Visitors Center while visiting the Central Oregon Coast during the summer. Um, and he always delights in exploring the world with his wife, Nancy, and captures much of it as much as he can with his camera. And with that, Dave, I will introduce you and you can take it over. Okay, thank, thank you very you so much. much. Yeah, thank you so much for being here. This is great, thanks. I'm gonna go to the PowerPoints now that I have and I have to, one moment while I go back to the beginning. And we'll start out now. Okay, so uh, we're going to talk about the geology of Cape Perpetua today. And it's an interesting geology. Um, when I travel around, especially if I settle in a place for a little bit, I want to know about what the rocks are. So I looked here and, and says, hmm, I wonder. 
And fortunately, um, well, I'm not a geologist, uh, a specialist in the geology of Oregon, but I've been able to read a lot and there's been a lot worked on, especially a lot worked uh, and a lot has been discovered since I um, was at Oregon State 50 years ago. So let's go ahead and um, quickly, oh, and again, my name is Muter, rhymes with computer, and we can um, kind of get an idea of where we are. Now, most of you are probably from this area, but for those of you who uh, may be tuning in from a, from a distance, we're in the Northwest of the United States in Oregon, between state of Washington and California. And we are um, uh, inland is some of the big cities and along the coast, we have others. We're here at Cape Perpetua that's uh, between Newport and Florence, just south of Yahats. Uh, uh, so we'll uh, take a look at Yahats. And this is a Google Earth view of Yahats and show for those of you who don't know uh, what Cape Perpetua is, this is the big promontory that sticks out into the ocean. It's the highest point on the Oregon coast that you can drive up to. Beautiful view. And so let's look from there. Whoop, I did this wrong. I need to get out there. Okay. So this is the view from Cape Perpetua looking down um, on the rocks. Um, here, the ocean stretching out with the marine reserve. And we also have the U.S. Forest Service uh, Visitor Center. So uh, unfortunately, it's closed right at the moment. Uh, we can still hike along the down to the beach and um, on some of the trails. But uh, for now, COVID has uh, unfortunately shut that down. But when I got here, I wanted to know why is there a rocky coast here further south? Um, once you get uh, close to Florence, it levels out and there's a uh, sandy stretch of beach for quite a while. And further north from Yahats, we also have some of uh, um, uh, rock uh, on, the, on the beach area, but then north of there, there's long stretches of beach. So, um, as you might imagine, I gave it away in the title of the talk, there was a volcano here. So the geology that we see, and we're going to talk about how the geologist figured out what was here, and let's go into talk about the questions we hope to answer in this little talk. Um, we're looking at what type of rocks there are in Cape Perpetua. How old are they? How were they formed? So these are all things we'll quickly talk about. And is what has happened since they were formed. So uh, were they moved from where they were formed or partially eroded away? Well, that's kind of a duh uh, statement because we don't see a volcano now. And um, so where did it go? Well, partially eroded. And have they been cracked and deformed? So, and then we'll look at what's happening now and what will happen in the future, at least uh, for a few things. One of the things we're gonna have to talk about, we'll spend a little time with a quick review of uh, the sense of deep time. The geologists think about millions of years and in our daily life, we just don't think about anything more than a few years or maybe a few hundred years. Um, so we have to think about that in a different way. And then we'll talk about a little about plate tectonics because that makes a big impact here on the coast. Okay, let's look at the Yahats um, basalt. This is the rock that we see down on the shoreline that's exposed by being battered by the ocean. Um, the rest of it is covered by that 
beautiful sp spruce forest and other vegetation that you get so plentifully here in Oregon. Um, and basalt is solidified lava. It's um, a igneous rock. So it formed and it forms at or very near the surface. It's like what is erupting in Hawaii now at the Kilauea volcano, or at least it was two years ago. Uh, it's dark in color and it's composed uh, mainly of plagioclase, feldspar, and pyroxene for those geologists out there who are interested. But the main feature about them is they're very fine grained. Uh, they have microscopic crystals. So if you pick up a rock, you don't, you see that it's just dark. You don't see any big crystals. Um, so that's because it formed rapidly uh, or cooled rapidly. And the crystals, the uh, different uh, elements didn't have a chance to find the right place to form nice big crystals, but rather form these small, um, small crystals. I can, uh, you probably don't see this, but I have a, a picture of a, a cobble of basalt here. So black rock is mainly what you see. Um, now, if it uh, basalt cools very rapidly, it forms obsidian glass. And that um, um, we don't see around here except in a, a, a few areas. So we'll, we'll talk about that later. Now, basalts are very common here on the Earth and even on the Moon and on Mars. So let's go on. That's Yahat's basalt. That's what it, where most of this rock is formed from. Um, but as we look at Thor's well, let's think about how old this rock is. The rock is about 37 million years old. So that's uh, unfathomable for most of us to think about, unless you've been um, a geologist who thinks about the time. So let's put that in perspective and talk a moment about deep time. And I like to use this diagram, which shows a circle of all of the uh, time the earth has been here. So I have, and I put a 12 hour clock in the middle because everybody kind of understands how much time 12 hours is. Well, 12 noon, we'll say is uh, when the earth formed 4.55 billion years ago. And at midnight is now. So we can go along the clock and see when things happen. So that's why I like the idea of the clock. Well, at two o'clock, about 4 billion years ago, uh, there is some evidence of life so life got here quite early, but it was very primitive. And then a little after eight, about 1.5 uh, billion years ago, multicellular life began. So this has been um, very interesting, but it wasn't until about 1036, 50, uh, 541 million years ago, that we have abundant fossils. This is the Cambrian. Um, and it, so 1036. Uh, another marker that many people heard, uh, know about is the dinosaurs. When did they rule the earth? And this is approximately from 1134 to 1150. So we just have 10 minutes left uh, when at the extinction of the dinosaurs. And that's when we came um, the mammals started to go. Okay, so the Yahats basalt, though, is about 37 million years old, or about um, 1154. So it's here in our 12-hour clock. Um, we can think of it as six minutes ago that the Yahats volcano was right here where uh, we sit, or at least some of us are. 
Now the geologic time scale, you can look at it in another way. This is a wonderful one by Ray Troll, Troll who had created this one, which gives us um, the history. I love this diagram because it shows us here looking back in time and all of the animals that have lived before in the different layers. And we also get um, the Cenozoic of the time now. Well, first of all, it's a nonlinear time scale. Our clock, we've uh, squeezed the first uh, 10 and a half hours into this small area because we don't know too much about it. We're learning more and more, but since we have fossils, we know much more, and that's why we expand this scale. And our Yahats basalt is here in the Eocene um, at 37 million years ago. So that kind of sets, sets the stage for that. Now, so we know a little bit about time when this thing happened um, 37 million years ago, but what is going on with the whole earth? And this has been in the last 50 to 60 years has been this revelation of plate tectonics, of understanding how the earth moves and especially the crust. Um, we can think of the earth as an egg and the shell of the egg is the crust, this hard uh, uh, area around the, uh, that is rigid and brittle and it will crack and have earthquakes. Below that and floating on that is this very viscous mantle. Think of the white of the egg. And then the yolk of the egg is the core, which is liquid except for a small inner core that's solid. Uh, iron, and it, it causes our magnetic field. So that's what the earth, uh, the layers of the earth, and we can look at how the mantle moves. It's heated from below by residual heat and radioactivity, so flows up, and as it spreads out near the surface, it carries along the plates and the plates are then driven by these convection currents in the mantle. And they break apart the crust into different plates. So let's look at some of those plates in this reconstruction. Remember, we have not just a solid, like a shell of an egg, we, it's cracked and the plates are jostling around. And this is 94 million years ago, a reconstruction, when North America over here, you can see Florida and um, uh, the east coast of the United States, broke away about 200 million years ago from Africa. And so the Atlantic is forming. It's much bigger now, but this was after 100 million years of separation. Uh, at that time, about 94 million years ago, it had been only 10 to tw uh, 20 to 30 million years since South America has moved away from Africa. You can see the shape of Africa here and South America here. So those are different plates that are moving away from each other. Let's look at it at a, uh, something at, in the current situation. So here's a map of the world now, but it is uh, with yellow lines showing where uh, the cracks are between the different plates. And we can see that there is a crack down the middle of the Atlantic Ocean that's op opening up. Here's North America moving in this direction, kind of almost rotating. It, it um, rotates a little bit. There's also distortion from uh, this being a flat surface. But let's concentrate on the Pacific Ocean where we can see these red arrows showing the direction of plate motion. And those red arrows, the bigger the arrow, the faster the plate is moving. So there, the Pacific plate is moving away from us and away uh, to the west. Uh, interestingly enough, and in one of the uh, evidences for plate tectonics, was the Hawaiian Islands, which forms a, a, a string of islands 
and they're at that same direction as the plate motion. And geologists looked at this and says, yeah, that plate is like a conveyor belt. So we'll look at the conveyor belt and think of the tectonic plates moving along as conveyor belt. They move along everything that is uh, on the plate, including islands, uh, many continents, or even the whole continent is being moved along in uh, by the plate. So the islands of Hawaii have been moved from where they were formed. Right now, there is a mantle plume called a hot spot that is right underneath the big island of Hawaii. And that, the hot, hot um, mantle plume uh, percolates through. Well, it, for one thing, we should, they're relative, the plumes are relatively stationary. And there's one here in Hawaii. Yellowstone is another hot spot. Iceland is another. So these are places around the earth where you get these hot mantle plumes that come up. And above them, the hot uh, la lava or magma can percolate through and come out as volcanoes. Um, so I went backwards instead of forwards. Okay, so now we can see then that uh, the big island of Hawaii, Kilauea and Mauna Loa, are the volcanoes there, are being built up now because it's still over the plume and we have an eruption just recently. This has all been built in the last million years, uh, or 0.7 actually million years. Before the plate was in 1.3 million years ago, the plate actually was back over here over the hot spot. And so Maui was created 1.3 million years ago. But the plate has moved and moved it to the west, a little bit to the northwest. Um, three million years ago, it was Oahu. And then five million years, Kauai. So the plate has gone over the hot spot, created, the, the created volcanoes, and then those volcanoes were um, moved like a conveyor belt uh, to the northwest, as we see here in this diagram. All right. And let's look at one of those, the Big Island of Hawaii, where the Kilauea volcano erupted in 2018. There was great coverage, um, especially by the uh, United States Geological Survey. The USGS did a great job of uh, doing, including these pictures that I'm using here. Um, and we, this is an analogy of the Cape Perpetua volcano. Now, we don't think it was over a hot spot, but it uh, was similar eruptions as we see in Hawaii. Uh, we get basalt being created. And uh, so the, right over the hot spot, or at least this is the crack that is um, letting lava up at, right at the moment. And then um, the lava comes out and this is a rapid flow of the lava from the vent that uh, the fissure to the sea. So these are some of the USGS videos showing the lava uh, spewing out from the fissure and then flowing like a river down even with rapids in the river but this is 1,500 or 1,700 uh, degree uh, temperature molten rock. Now it, the crust fo starts forming on it as it goes away, uh, but it's, and it covers the landscape. Wherever it breaks out, it cools and covers the landscape. A lot of um, problems uh, with destruction. Um, but when it comes to the sea, it actually builds out more and the island gets bigger as the lava pours into the sea. And as it pours into the sea, it is quickly quenched and forms these kind of like toothpaste tubes um, with a glass exterior. And then it breaks out and the hot lava uh, comes out again, forming another one of these um, uh, toothpaste uh, squirts and it again um, cools rapidly. 
So there's obsidian on the outside of what these formation are called uh, pillow basalts because they kind of look like pillows in cross section. So if we see those, we can say this was close to an um, a close to a uh, ocean, and we see some in uh, the Yahats basalt. Okay, now we're going to go back and look at. Um, where we are now up here in the Pacific Northwest and see our plate motion. We have the Pacific Ocean is moving away, but there's a small plate, kind of a residual plate called the Juan de Fuca plate that we'll look at and see what's happening right here. This is a map view of actually Washington with Mount St. Helens here and Mount Adams uh, and a little bit of Oregon right uh, here. But we see the Juan de Fuca plate and it's being formed offshore about 300 miles offshore, 500 kilometers, um, where the ridge is coming apart. Again, the two plates are coming, coming apart and they're uh, splitting. The lava or magma comes up and fills this split and solidifies to form new oceanic crust. Now the Juan de Fuca plate coming this way toward the North America continent, um, something has to give when the two plates come together. And in this case, the oceanic crust is heavier and uh, it's made of darker materials that are slightly heavier than the uh, continental crust so they are pushed down and they are what we call subducted underneath. So that's um, called subduction. And as the plate descends, it starts to heat up again. And some of that comes up as uh, more magma that comes to the surface and we get a volcano like Mount St. Helens, like Mount Hood, like all, this whole string of volcanoes uh, from uh, British Columbia all the way down to Northern California. Let's look at a little bit more about this subduction. Again, the oceanic crust is formed over here as magma comes up and cools. You can get some volcanoes there. You also could get a volcano or a mini continent that's floating on this that is being brought in to um, uh, to the North American continent. Also, there's sediments that are uh, coming down, um, as well as sediments that come in by rivers from the continents. So we're getting a lot of sediments coming in. But as what I want to emphasize here, as the ocean crust comes in, most of it goes down and remelts. There's a little bit that melts and comes back up. But a few pieces get scraped off. We call it accreted, but it gets scraped off and plastered against the continent. And that's what we call accretion. And the geologists know that Oregon now is made mostly of accreted material that has been scraped off in the last 200 million years. Okay. So, we call those accretionary terrains, especially if they're a big island chain or like Hawaii that, uh, that uh, crashes into it or uh, a mini continent. So let's look at what Oregon looks like. And it is composed of these accretionary terrains, some of the crumpled up accreted material plus some bigger blocks. And we call the bigger blocks um, uh, these accretionary terrains. The last one that was, uh, well, first of all, if 200 million years ago, the beaches, the Pacific Ocean beaches were in Idaho. So you would have had beachfront property if you're from Idaho um, 200 million years ago. But all of this has been built out. The last big block called Siletsia has was docked about 56 million years ago. And 
then um, other things have formed on top of it. We've had volcanic, the high cascades have been built up and a lot of the accretion of this has pushed up the coastal range. So a lot of things have happened um, since uh, in the last 200 million years ago, a million years. And one of those things is this volcano here. So let's look a little closer uh, with a geologic map of the Oregon Coast Range. And we have um, over here Portland and down to Roseburg. And on the coast, here's Newport. So we're south of Newport. This blue area is the Yahats Basalt. So that's what we are with the north near Cape Perpetua. Actually, Yahats is right at the north. It actually extends up a little bit inland to almost to uh, Waldport. And south, we have Aceta Head um, is kind of the last big outcrop in Seal Rock before you, uh, or Seal Caves, before you get down into Florence. So that is the area that was this volcano 37 million years ago. What did it look like when this was happening? Remember, it's not, we've added a lot of stuff since then. So 37 million years ago, it was the Celestia terrain had already docked, but it wasn't, a lot of it was not above sea level. So if you were in Salem or Eugene at the time, you would have been underwater. Portland probably was above uh, water at that time. Um, uh, but there were some offshore islands, and we know that uh, a volcano was on one of those islands. You also have some deltas out here indicating that there was uh, some kind of uh, watershed, so it must have been a moderate size island off, off uh, the coast of here uh, where the volcano was. Now, we also have um, during this time, a twisting of Oregon. Um, California is pushing north, that plate is pushing, really pushing north, and uh, Canada to the north is not moving. And so what's happening is Oregon and Washington are kind of the bumper cars that are being squished, the small little um, cars that are being squished between um, those two big plates. And, um, in this twisting uh, mo um, of Oregon, there were probably some faults and cracks, and those faults allowed magma to come back up. Uh, and that's what caused the volcano. We think that's true because there are other similar age vo uh, volcanoes, and we can see other um, uh, uh, volcanoes at about the same time. Uh, one is at Cascadia Head in Lincoln City and the Tillamook Volcanics, and even up in Washington, the Gray River Volcanics. So that's nice. All uh, right, so we have that as uh, where the volcano was. Now um, let's see what happens to the volcanoes. Uh, of course, much of it is eroded away but it erodes slower than other rocks. So it creates these headlands and capes. It, um, that's why we have Cape Perpetua sticking up there. Whereas further north, it's all sandy beaches. But it can crack during earthquakes. And when it cracks, it is exposed to the wave action of the ocean. And these cracks are widened by erosion of that and by the constant wave action. And though that has created Devil's Churn and uh, Cook's Chasm that are down uh, just um, uh, in the Cape Perpetua area. Uh, I wanted to mention one other thing, a kind of an interesting fact, that during this 37 million years, Oregon has moved north to cooler climates. What were the, we see now, the vegetation we see now is not what we see when we look at the fossils from 37 million years ago in sediments surrounding um, or at age dated about the same time. Um, those were more tropical. So we have moved north from hotter climates to the north. Okay, now, so let's 
we're going to uh, talk about building the volcano. Of course, it erupted and we can see how volcanoes are built by looking at the um, volcanoes on Hawaii or looking in our Cascade Range. So we have a volcano being built, the eruptions go on, but even while it's erupting, we get weathering and erosion occurs. So the weathering is where the um, rock breaks down and then it's carried off. So the weather, um, the weathering is that breakdown of rock in air and water. And then landslides and rivers carry that down to the sea, carry away all this weathered rocks and soil. But let's take a look and then finally it's eroded down to what we've seen, just remnants of this uh, volcano. But let's look at the shoreline because it's an interesting place. We're going to look at the um, what we call the wave attack zone, and that's between high tide and a bit below low tide where there's still a lot of wave action, and that's where you can get erosion that erodes back the um, rock to a cliff. So let's look even closer at that, and the sea cliff is eroded back, and we'll see here how the tide can undercut, these waves can undercut the sediment uh, the, and the rock and the sediment, and you get pieces that fall into the sea. And then the tide and the waves back and forth so that they are eroded away and the sand carried out. Even hard rock can break, crack and crumble, and the waves attack it, and sooner or later, um, after many years, they also disappear. So we can see that the cliff, as these, uh, this rock tumbles, it retreats back and we get um, a wave cut platform here formed. This is slightly dipping toward the ocean, um, but it's a fairly flat, smooth surface. So we say that's leaves behind this wave cut platform or terrace sometimes it's called. So we do have wave cut platform here, right? Looking again down at Cape Perpetua and um, out in front of Yahats as well as other areas, we get these wave cut platforms. Newport actually is built on one, but it's not basalt. All right, so um, I'm, you may say, but you said that these wave cut platforms form below sea level, below low tide. Why are they sticking out there? And that's the question I'm asking you. Why is this above sea level? And of course, you hopefully think back to plate tectonics. And plate tectonics show here the accretion and wedges of accreted material are jammed in and uplift the coastal area. As another wedge comes in, it pushes up the coastal area, and that is what has built the coastal range. Okay, so now we have an idea of why these things are there. Let's look at some of the details, Spouting Horn and Thor's Well, which are kind of fun to see, and of course everybody wants to look at these. I went down with my camera a couple years ago and caught the, the spouting horn when it was spouting. And there it is going. And um, we should see another wave come in and another spout. They even talk about a blowhole. So there is a hole there, but what does the rest of the thing look like? I went back at low tide and this is what it looks like, an undercut kind of cave that's uh, being cut back and, um, but what has happened is that cave was undercut, but some kind of weakness caused a hole to develop in the rock. And then if you have a hole there, the crest of the wave at a certain time comes in and it has to be when the waves are breaking high enough to cause this, as well as 
them coming in at the right tide level. So here at the Spouting Horn at Cape Perpetua, you need it to be near high tide when this thing goes off. So what happens is the wave comes in, it seals off the opening, and then the rest of the um, wave is, and the air that was in the uh, cave is forced out as a spouting horn. Uh, the mist, it's actually a mist, so a little water, but a lot of air, mostly air. And we'll take another quick look at the spouting horn again. And there it blows. Well, that wasn't a very good blow. The next one is better. Yeah. Okay, then let's look at Thor's Well. And this is an uh, area down uh, right next to the water. And you can see it here. We'll look a little closer. And it um, is, looks like a well that fills and then um, uh, flushes out and then fills again and flushes out. So what's happening here? We can see how it, it all of a sudden disappears. The water comes up and then disappears. So let's look, if you go back at low tide, you see that there's a whole bunch of mussels and um, blue, blue mussels and barnacles all around the edge. This is perfect uh, for them. All that water with uh, nutrients that are that little plankton that they can feed on. But Thor's well is kind of special because it's not just a collapsed area. It, it has a entrance out to the open ocean. So there is a tunnel that is open out to the ocean. So if you think about it now, uh, we would have again an undercut uh, sea cliff, maybe an old lava, but the top of it, um, uh, maybe an old lava tube, but the top of it could form, and it may be to start out with was a spouting horn, but the um, a large portion of the cave collapsed in, so it leaves behind this well, and the wave then comes in. Uh, right now, the water's going back out, but as the wave comes in, it again splashes up and fills the well to overflowing, and then the cycle repeats. So you need a connection to the ocean in order to have something like Thor's well. So I have a, again, a picture of this. And here I might mention, you don't want to stand down too close. A sneaker wave could come in and knock you off your feet. I especially don't like this fellow over here holding his son up or his kid up um, because he's standing in areas that will um, flood with water and you just need uh, up to mid calf in order to sweep you off your feet. We have lost some people there, but it is impressive. <laughs> it's really impressive. Okay. Just one more thing that I want to talk about and then we'll wrap it up. And that's the Columbia River basalts. And this is amazing. Okay. So you go north and you go next north, you see some basalt rock at Seal Rock, and you go up in Yahat's, um, at uh, the Yaquinta Head, um, and they're basalt, and you say, oh, there must have been another volcano up there. Well, no, <laughs> and that's something we didn't know about 50 years ago when I went on a field trip with, uh, in my geology class uh, to Seal Rock. That rock actually uh, was erupted way far away. It was erupted during the it, by in Eastern Oregon as part of the Columbia River basalts. They flooded this whole area, uh, a third of Washington and a quarter of Oregon are covered by these Columbia River basalts. You see them all over in Eastern uh, Washington and Oregon. Um, they were about 15 million years ago and they most likely started with that um, onset of the Yellowstone hotspot 
Yellowstone is here now. And remember, as I said, the plates are conveyor belts. And so back 15 million years ago, we had the hot spot that was underneath um, this area, and now it's underneath Yellowstone. So the plate has moved southwest. Uh, but that was about 16.1 million years ago. There was a big explosion of the Yellowstone um, uh, vault hotspot, and that's about the same time as we see the Columbia River basalts. But how did it get all the way out here? Amazingly enough, this was very fluid rock, very hot, and it traveled 400 to 500 kilometers, about 300 miles, um, through um, the Columbia River area and out to the ocean, went further north into Washington, but traveled down the coast all the way down and made it the most southerly part that we know of is out here at Seal Rock. Um, more than 300 miles and it's estimated that it took six days. Just boggling, mind-boggling to think of how much lava that that is. Okay, um, I want to wrap up now. We're getting uh, at the end of the time, but I, as a summary, we have a volcano that was erupted. The volcano was erupted here 37 million years ago. Basalt uh, was solidified lava um, and it cooled quickly near the surface. And it was near the shoreline, as I said, it, we saw some um, pillow basalts. And much of it is eroded away, but it still tells the story about it. And the, we talked about wave cut platforms that are uplifted. And then we have these uh, amazing features that interact with the waves like Thor's well and the spouting horn. A few references I'll uh, leave up while we uh, go on to questions, but these uh, I've learned a lot, uh, especially coming back to Oregon after being gone for a long time. And uh, we've learned a lot about, about Oregon. And here are some of these wonderful uh, references that you too can look at to get more information. Uh, the roadside geology of Oregon is great. Okay, so are there any questions? We have Tara back online, uh, and I will stop and we can have the questions. This is good. Yeah, um, so I forgot to mention at the beginning, we have a couple questions that came in, but if you do have a question, feel free to put them in the Q&A section um, or the chat. I'll even see it if you put it in the chat, and then we will get those answered as we can come to them. So Dave, the first question is, are the cascades formed from accreted material? Uh, no, uh, not from accreted material. It's the, um, as the plate subducts, then we get partial melting of the plate that comes up and uh, forms volcanoes. So most of that is formed by volcanic activity. Uh, there is some of the Northern cascades that are accreted material. So, any of the volcanic stuff as, as um, uh, came up, melted, but further north, we get, do get some um, uh, uh, accreted material that was accreted a long time ago. Um, down here too, there is some, but, but um, the um, volcanoes tend to obscure everything and flow over the top of everything. <laughs> I think that's so mind blowing to think how different the Yahats basalt is compared to what flowed in from the east, eastern yeah. part, then down south. It's, it's just amazing, blows but my mind. Looks like basalt. <laughs> if you look at both of them, they kind of look the same. The yeah. basalt. <laughs> to the average eye. Yeah. Okay, our next question is where was the volcano, and in, in regards to the Yahats volcano, where was the volcano relative to the current shoreline? Okay, so it was near uh, shore. Um, but it was on an offshore island. So, and it was further south, as we, I said, it, it, we have moved north and probably further west. So all of the, this area has moved um, as well as North America plowing this way toward the uh, southwest is, is so um, you have to, think relative, but relative to the, the um, um, North America continent, 
Yahat's bas um, basalt was maybe a little farther offshore, but has not moved very much uh, toward, uh, let's say, toward Eugene from when it was erupted. Okay, and then our next question is, this is a good one. We see a lot of yellow colored crumbly rock, especially near the surface. What are they? Um, and then it says a geologist who surveyed uh, their lot said it was eroded basalt, but why is it yellow? Ah, that's interesting. And I'm not a very good mineralogist, so I'm going to have to punt on that one. I think um, um, we, and basalt does erode down, um, and you can see the rocks getting smaller. In fact, we'll talk a bit about erosion uh, next week on um, uh, a lecture about wave sands and beaches. And so I'll go ahead and, and um, look up to see what causes the yellow and we'll talk about it next week. <laughs> Very Sorry. cool. I noticed that we've seen it in our beach cleanups too. These little, it, it, they do, they look like yellowish rocks. It's very interesting. Yeah. Okay, next question. So how did the minerals accumulate in the coast range? Specifically, there is gold in Alsea Bay, but no apparent source. Yes, well, gold is interesting. Um, it's it's um, further inland, you can get some, um, well, but first of all, you can also um, um, get uh, different minerals formed um, out at the spreading centers, um, and you can have those accreted onshore, and some of these many continents that come and uh, have accreted. Um, so you could get some gold there, but the source of those would be upstream. Uh, gold, of course, is pulled down, um, uh, er eroded out of the rocks, and then uh, follows and or is is um, uh, transported by the streams, the rivers. So I don't know. That's another one that I'm going to have to punt on. Again, I, <laughs> I'm not a expert on this area of the geology, unfortunately. <laughs> All right, and then we have another question coming through the chat. It says, when they fish offshore, they look to the shore and can see many cone-shaped mountains. Are these vents, volcanoes? What might you suggest? Okay, so um, the uh, shape of a mountain is often um, kind of conical and depends. I mean, even if you looked at uh, Cape Perpetua, it's, it's elongate, but uh, looking at it from one angle, you would see that it looks kind of uh, like a mountain. So, um, no, unless you can see all the way into the Cascades, there's not volcanoes now, uh, just uh, a few remnants like this, but no, you wouldn't, we wouldn't see it. I, I think they would just be erosional features. So. Okay. Next question. North of Yahats is Balsat. Celtic sandstone, and that seems to be an oxymoron. <laughs> How is balsat basaltic? It's a hard word to say. Basaltic yeah. <laughs> sandstone created. Okay, so uh, the uh, ocean is an amazing uh, churning process, and it can break down. If you've probably just gone north of Yahat, you'll see that cobble beach, and we'll talk. Uh, I have a picture of it for next week's slide, and the. Uh, water bashes those together and breaks them down into smaller and smaller par particles. So you get a black beach. And in um, Hawaii, you get a lot of black beaches because that's all there uh, is, or mostly is made up of basalt. So you can get these, but they break down, at, and especially at those, they break down rapidly. Whereas quartz, uh, the white sand uh, that you find sometimes does not break down as fast. Very interesting. Okay, I don't know if so you'll be able the, to answer black, this. Yeah, the, the, uh, what I'm trying to say is the black sand <laughs> will disappear faster than the quartz white, the whiter sands. Oh. Okay. Um, okay, here's a good one. Oh, okay. yes. Go ahead. I, I wanted to just jump back. Um, <laughs> to uh, that gold question. 
And not only are there um, volcanoes in the Cascade Range, uh, when you get the melting of the rocks that come up um, from the subduction, you also can get uh, some that don't reach the surface. And those have time to cool at uh, depth and differentiate the different um, minerals. And so you can get some uh, gold and other mineral deposits there. So I, that's an a, a additional to uh, answer to the question about gold. Very cool. I have a feeling you get this one a lot. When is the next quake? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, thought, I think it's tomorrow or maybe 200 <laughs> years from now. Um, it's, it's, it's always um, a question, yes. Um, we, we could have, have it happen anytime. Uh, there's been some good research done offshore um, looking for deposits that uh, tumble down the slope uh, called turbidity currents. Uh, and they all seem to uh, be um, uh, synchronous over a large area. So we know we will get these big earthquakes every 300, 500, 600 years. We know that the last earthquake was uh, 320 years ago. So it could happen any time. My bet is that it won't be immediately. I mean, the odds are, will get better and better um, 50 years from now, 100 years from now, um, we'll have better odds. But it could happen any time. We, we don't know. Know your route out, right? Go mm. up. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so this is a two-part question. They say, thank you for the informative talk. Um, how do you tell the difference between the eastern basalt and the Yahats basalt? Oh, OK. Um, I can't tell very <laughs> much difference. Um, uh, because they both look the same, you'd have to look under a microscope and then you would have to do chemical analysis. So the chemical analysis has a, a each um, uh, lava flow has kind of its own chemical uh, fingerprint. So you'd look at that and then you would also age date it. And so you could get an age dating that would be the same as, um, so from the naked eye, no, can't tell. <laughs> or at least I can't. If you see a lot of those um, columnar, like Seal Rock has a beautiful columnar basalts up at uh, you Quinn ahead has uh, beautiful uh, columnar basalts. That is probably more of a um, uh, an indication that it came from Eastern Oregon. Mm. And then the second part of that, they ask, is subduction still happening and thus accretion along the Oregon coast? And is there visible evidence of it? Accretion is happening every time uh, we have a big earthquake. <laughs> and, and then it will add a little bit more to it. But in the meantime, uh, uh, between these big earthquakes, nothing much is happening. So it, it's that those little slices get accreted um, when we have a big earthquake. And we're talking about, again, every 300, 600 mm -hmm. years, we'll, we'll get an uplift um, and um, a, more, a little more accretion. But um, no, um, day to day, you can't go out and see what's happening. You can see that there is motion of the continent um, they, they actually have GPS uh, positioned all over the, um, the um, Pacific Northwest, and uh, they can actually see that this uh, geophone moved a centimeter to the north this year, or moved five, three centimeters. Uh, so they actually can tell, and that's one of the reasons they can tell that Oregon is twisting and being twisted by California ramming us from the south. Those pushy Californians, and I can say that because I'm a Californian. <laughs> okay, just a few more. Why is there so many round gobbles, cobblestones at Bob Creek? Okay, so if you have a lot, lot of rock there that's being exposed and breaking down and, and crumbling into the ocean, then you'll get the back and forth motion of the... Um, of the waves, uh, cleaning them up and bashing them together. 
and cracking them into smaller pieces uh, and rounding them, making those nice round shapes. I mean, there's they're really cool uh, round shapes. Whoop, it disappears sometimes. <laughs> um, and uh, another one that I have, so uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, anyway. They're magical. <laughs> Basalt, I think I picked those up <laughs> near Bob's Creek or one of those areas down south. Um, so and yeah, then, it's just the ocean doing its thing, breaking down uh, stuff that has fallen in. So you'll see some cliffs along there and, and maybe some brought in by Bob's Creek, uh, bigger, bigger rocks brought in and then they're tumbled around. And um, so it uh, depends on the sources that where that's being fed into that area. Well, it sure makes a pretty sound on the cobble rock when the waves come in and then the oh, water goes it? back through the rock. Yeah. It's so meditative sound. <laughs> so these last couple questions are somewhat similar. So I'm gonna kind of combine them. Uh, what is the source of obsidian found at Hasita Beach? And then the next one is, are there any obsidian deposits near Cape Perpetua where? I haven't seen any obsidian deposits all I've, i and i haven't seen them down at, at um, aceta beach um, either but i know down that way there is this pillow basalts as i said at some point a lava flow from the yahats volcano flowed into the water and what we have um uh it, then it forms pillow basalt which quenches the outside so you can get little pieces of uh, lava. I went up on Mary's Peak, you can uh, see some beautiful pieces of, um, and I, I'm blanking, but th this is a piece of pillow basalt and you can kind of see the reflections on it. And those reflections are the obsidian glass on the surface. But as far as big pieces of obsidian, I don't know where you would, you would find them but I'll, I'll go look for them and um, ask a, a local rock guy because there, there are plenty of uh, uh, those <laughs> around and they have yeah. questions that stump me every time. Nice. Can't know everything, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm finding out I'm knowing less and less. <laughs> well, Dave, that is the end of our questions for now. I appreciate you again so much coming and pre uh, sharing this uh, wealth of knowledge you've got around the geology of this area. It fascinates me that you come and you visit here every summer and it, you get so interested in it. You just learn so much about it. And I love learning from love you about that. Yeah. Um, yeah. And next week we have our presentation with Dave, the second part of the series, Waves, Sand and Beaches, the Constantly Changing Shoreline, um, next Tuesday at 6 p.m. We did record this video, and so we will be posting this presentation tomorrow to our YouTube channel. Um, so if you would like a replay or if anybody's got any questions, I know our registration filled up. Feel free to point them to our YouTube channel. Um, and yeah, with that, I uh, thank you again, Dave. Thank you, everybody, for joining us this evening and hope to see you next week. Thank you. Bye now. Bye-bye.